Today is a day that will go down in history. If you have tuned into this podcast before, you know we have an AI assistant that is trained on all 200 and like 80 episodes of this podcast. We call it Jason Bot, and it pretty accurately answers questions the same way that I would. Uh, but today, we're putting it to the test. We're literally going head to head. We're going to use a third party judge. I will answer a series of questions. Jason Bot will answer a series of questions, and the judge will score our answers on three, three like yardsticks, and we'll see who's better. Can the Jason Bot really stack up to the real deal? I think not, but today we're actually going to put a number to it. So come on in. Let's just see how good of an advisor AI can really be. Not a chance, AI. Without further ado, here are the rules of the game. And you better believe that we generated some AI game show music uh, that I haven't listened to yet that we're going to cut in for each of the questions uh, because this, this won't go off the rails as it is enough, I'm sure. All right. Here's how this is going to work. We've got five questions. I will answer those questions myself in like a paragraph or two to the best of my ability. We're gonna chuck those same five questions at JasonBot, a AI chat assistant that we've made with a tool called Delphi, D-E-L-P-H-I. We've talked about it in past episodes quite a bit that is trained on all the episodes of this podcast. That chat bot, that assistant, that avatar of me will answer those same five questions. So we have answers from me and from JasonBot. We will then put those answers into Claude, the AI tool, and it will judge those answers on three criteria. The first, completeness. Did it completely answer the question? Second, accuracy. How good actually is that answer? And three, clarity. Is it something that an accountant who runs a small firm would actually understand? So every single one of these answers will have three scores. We'll tally up the scores after five questions. And if I lose, I will never publish another podcast. I'm just, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. I, hopefully I don't lose. Surely I won't lose. Like it's a, it's a clone of me, right? So it can't be better than me. Okay, question number one. And it is a classic. How do I find better clients for my small accounting firm? All right. This is the actual prompt that I put into Delphi. What's the best way to find better clients for my small accounting firm. I have not seen the AI answer yet because I don't want it to impact how I would answer. It's very easy to come along after something and be like, oh no, this or that's how you improve on it. I'm doing it blind. It's creating an answer blind. I'm creating an answer blind. Uh, here is my answer. And I'm using actually a speech to text tool to record my voice as I um, answer this on my laptop. It'll create a text transcript. So as I say it, it's capturing this. All right. How to find better clients in your accounting firm. Uh, in my opinion, the best place to start is by doubling down on your happiest clients today. The ones who happily pay the bill and don't complain because you're solving meaningful pains for them. Learn more about why those are painful pains, like from the client, and consider how you could find others who feel those pains acutely so that you can serve other folks who will uh, appreciate you and be willing to pay you more than the clients that you have today. You can certainly go out and try to find clients on social media, but, but probably today, for most people, the shortest path is to go to the premium clients you already have and seek out more clients like them, ask them for referrals. Ugh. I don't, I feel insecure about that answer, I'll be totally honest. It wasn't as clear as, I don't know, other versions of that answer that I think I've given, given before. Okay, let's see what AI said. I'm gonna check it in a voice tool that just puts a voice to its response. I hope I don't get penalized for my response being a, like a little bit bumbling. Okay, this voice won't sound like me, but this is Jason Bot answering the same question. Finding better clients for your small accounting firm is all about specialization and leveraging new media. Oh shoot. You want to carve out a niche for yourself where you can be the go-to expert. For instance, if you specialize in a specific industry like private air charter, you become the obvious choice for businesses in that sector one. 
Start by identifying a niche that aligns with your expertise and interests. Then use platforms like social media, podcasts, and online communities to share valuable content that speaks directly to the needs of your target audience, too. This approach not only increases your visibility, but also builds your reputation as an authority in that niche. Okay. <laughs> that might have been a better answer than I gave. Here's the thing. That's how I would answer that question on a longer time horizon. For the immediate time horizon, like if I want to go get a client tomorrow, I would say go to your best clients. Am I already explaining why I'm going to lose question number one? All right. So I put these two answers into Claude. I will paste the text of that one in here. I'm trying to make it not biased. So I'm not even telling it it's an AI system. I'm, I'm actually saying here's Jason's response and here's JB's response because I could see AI favoring the human just in like how they're set up. So I'm, I'm not even telling it the context. I'm saying actually the exact prompt, two colleagues are blindly answering questions and you will judge it. And then I gave it the rules for how to judge it. So it's now going to evaluate our two responses. Okay, this feels like the perfect voice for our judge here. I'll evaluate both responses based on completeness, accuracy, and clarity for a small accounting firm audience, okay. rating each aspect from 1 to 10. JB's response, completeness, that's, that's Jason 7 to 10. Seven JB's out of answer 10. Okay. covers specialization, leveraging new media, and becoming an expert in a niche. It provides a specific example and mentions multiple platforms for sharing content. Accuracy, 8 to 10. The Eight. advice given is generally accurate and aligns with modern marketing strategies for professional services. The focus on specialization and content marketing is particularly relevant. Clarity, 610. Ooh. While the information is valuable, the structure could be clearer for a small accounting firm audience. The example of private air charter might not resonate with all readers. Combined score for JB2130. Jason's response. Okay, well, the private the private air charter thing was because I did an episode about a private air charter niche. So we can hardly blame that on the AI. Its worst score was Clarity, 6 out of 10. Let's just cruise through that. All right, here's the score that it's giving me. So it gave it a 7, an 8, and a 6. Let's see what it gives me. Completeness, 8, 10. Jason's answer covers leveraging existing happy clients, understanding their pain points, finding similar clients, and seeking referrals. It provides a comprehensive strategy focused on current strengths. Accuracy, 9, 10. Oh, 9! The advice is highly accurate Woo. and practical, especially for a small accounting firm. The focus on existing clients and referrals is a proven strategy in the professional services industry. Darn tootin'. Clarity, 9, 10. Oh, 9! The response is very clear and easy to understand for a small accounting firm owner. It uses straightforward language and provides actionable advice. Combined score for Jason... 2630, winner for question one. Not Jason even Jason's close. response is the winner for this question. While both responses offer valuable advice, Jason's answer is more tailored to the specific needs of a small accounting firm. It provides clear, actionable steps that are easy to implement and focuses on leveraging existing resources, happy clients, to grow the business. Mm -hmm. The clarity and practicality of Jason's response make it more accessible and immediately useful for the target audience. Oh man, is that what I just said? There's is my long, like JB's, Jason Bots is my long-term plan. What I said is my short-term plan. It's kind of hard to disagree with any of it because it literally is all things that I've said before. So I'm not even exactly sure who I'm fighting against. Okay, I beat that by five points. Let me chuck this into a spreadsheet here. So after round one, I have 26 points. Jason Bot has 21 points. Get absolutely dusted. Okay, question number two. Whoa, dramatic. Okay, question number two, here we go. A client just complained about their bill. What do I do? All right, uh, I'm gonna start recording my response here on my laptop so it'll create a transcript of it. Here's my answer to the question of client just complained about a bill, what do I do? Um, I would say you likely need to stick to your guns because setting the precedent of Fees being negotiable will be problematic long-term. Try, try to get an understanding of where the client's coming from. If they're unwilling to pay, it could be that they're not very acutely feeling the pain that you've solved for them. Long-term, this would be a good thing to address, to be aware of in your firm, because your firm needs to attract clients that feel the pains you solve really acutely. This client obviously is not feeling that. <sighs> 
I'll be honest. I don't feel great about that. Uh, I don't know how actionable that is. Okay, here's the response from Jason Bot to the same question. Client just complained about their bill. What do I do? Ah, the classic billing complaint scenario. Ah. First off, don't panic. It's important to approach this calmly and professionally. Listen to their concerns first and try to understand where they're coming from. Sometimes it's just a matter of clarifying what the bill covers, especially if you're providing detailed, high-quality services that they might not be fully aware of. Dang it. Next, review the bill together. Make sure there are no errors and explain each charge. Transparency here is key. If the complaint is about the value of the service, then it's a great opportunity to highlight the benefits and results of your work. Remember, communication is your best tool in these situations. If the issue persists, consider if there's room for a compromise, like a one-time discount or a payment plan, mm. especially if you value maintaining a long-term relationship. It's all about finding a balance that respects both your business's needs and your client's concerns. Lastly, consider this a learning opportunity. Maybe it's time to revisit how you communicate pricing and billing up front to avoid similar issues in the future. <laughs> I feel like that was a better answer in every way than mine, with the exception of saying compromise. I don't know. That's something I have a hard time with budging. Reality is if I have a really long-term relationship with a client, there's a version of compromise that will happen, usually not on fees, but on scope. Uh, I'm, I might have just lost that one. Okay, let's throw that one at the judge. See what they have to say. I'm up five after the first question. So I've got quite the lead already. I'll evaluate both responses based on completeness, accuracy, and clarity with each category scored out of 10. Then I'll provide a combined score and determine a winner. JB's response. Completeness, 9-10. JB provides a comprehensive approach covering initial reaction, listening to concerns, reviewing the bill, explaining charges, highlighting value, considering compromises, and using it as a learning opportunity. Accuracy, 8-10. The advice given is generally accurate and aligns with good business practices. However, it could be more specific to accounting firms. Clarity, 7-10. While the response is detailed, it may be slightly overwhelming for someone running a small accounting firm. The language is accessible, but the response could be more concise and structured. Combined score for JB. 24:30. Jason's response, completeness, 5:10. Ah! Jason's response is brief and focuses on a single approach. It doesn't explore multiple options or steps to handle the complaint. Accuracy by 7:10. The advice to maintain pricing integrity is accurate and relevant to small businesses. The insight about client pain points is valuable, but the response lacks other important aspects of handling billing complaints. Clarity 8:10. The response is clear and straightforward, easy for a small accounting firm owner to understand and implement. Combined score for Jason, 2030. Winner, JB's response, 24 to 30. JB's response wins due to its more comprehensive approach and higher overall score. While Jason's response has merit in its clarity and focus on maintaining pricing integrity, JB's answer provides a more complete toolkit for handling billing complaints. It really does. Be more useful for someone running a small accounting firm. Okay. I'm winning by one. Uh, my whole lead just, just evaporated. Do we need to stop to consider what it means if, if I lose? Um, I'm already realizing uh, the answer, quality of the answer is going to be in the eye, eye the, uh, the beholder, right? Maybe there's a version of this we can do down the road where the judge is human or even a, a panel of humans. I, in myself, like just listening to these two answers, the way I would score these, I honestly think I would be scoring it better than me so far. And maybe part of the problem is like, it's drop of a hat, like I'm not writing my best possible response. It's kind of like somebody asks me and I'm doing it off the top of my head. It's not as good as it could be, but that's also how we advise our clients is off the top of our head, right? This episode is sponsored in part by Team Up. Story time. Gather around, sit in a circle. Jonathan, happy Team Up customer. See if this story sounds uh, sounds relatable. Clients were beating down Jonathan's door. He was growing so quickly he couldn't keep up. The problem was he couldn't find anyone in the US at a salary that he could really afford. Then he had an experience that opened his eyes. He hired his first accountant in the Philippines. 
couldn't believe how good she was. Not only did she do the work well, but she was fast. So we hired another, this time a senior accountant. He wanted her to be in charge of quality assurance. He needed her to do things like set up special funding accounts and make sure equity accounts are correct. Things he struggled to get his US staff to do well. It went so well with the senior accountant, he hired another. And then in a few months, another. Now, not only is client work getting done on time, he has room to grow. Good for you, Jonathan. Here's a quote from Jonathan. We've hired very high level accounting talent stateside. I have to say that our Philippines based team is outperforming most of our US based staff. How dare you, Jonathan? I was absolutely blown away with the type of candidates that we got from our job posting. Team Up really helped us navigate the things we weren't sure of. That's Jonathan's story. A real live accountant just like you. For some reason, we have this thing in our head. Maybe it's an American thing where you think when you hire somebody that's not in your country, they're not going to be as good as somebody in your country just because their power plugs look different. But that, you know, that just doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? If you're exploring hiring folks in the Philippines, if you are stuck on your, your U.S. hiring strategy, hit up Team Up, link down in the show notes to help you find some super talented accountants in the Philippines that'll get that client work straight out the door on time. This episode is sponsored in part by LiveFlow. You ever look at the reporting apps and think, uh, man, I don't, I don't need another PhD in learning this new hard thing just to tell my clients what they need to do or to give them a fancy report that they're not even going to look at. Sometimes, sometimes the old ways are the best. The best just plug it into a spreadsheet. That's what LiveFlow does. Takes all of your accounting data, the QBO stuff, and you now have a plugin in your Excel or in your Google Sheets that with just a, a just a whippity click, a couple clicks, and you've got all of your client data for any QBO clients you've got access to. You got that stuff in a spreadsheet. Pull it, pull it in like one time, do a live sync that never stops. All your favorite reports from QuickBooks, Pull it in, just use those reports, create your own sheets that reference those reports. And so it's like live updating information. Man, if you are a spreadsheet enthusiast, it is like, it's like the upgrade your spreadsheets have always needed. Like putting a jetpack on a something old that hasn't changed that much on Jim Belushi. If that resonates with you, check out LiveFlow, link in the show notes. Okay, three questions to go. I would genuinely rather not lose this. Question number three. We worked way too many hours this tax season. Give me your best two ideas to overcome this bottleneck. What the hell is this game show song? This doesn't sound like a game show song at all. Thanks for nothing, AI. Okay, my answer. Best two. Um, okay, number one, lean harder into tax planning. Uh, this lets you work with clients in November and December to figure out how much tax they owe. It front loads the work outside of busy season. Uh, and then your clients don't even need to like file until the extended season. They already know how much they could owe and hopefully made payments before the end of the year. That's number one. Number two, uh, reduce the number of clients you work with for whom tax planning isn't a great fit. For the most simple tax clients, it's really hard to justify doing tax planning for them, thus like making it hard to justify filing an extension and getting them out of that busy season. These are just really hard clients to serve. And you don't want to prioritize those clients at the expense of your best clients who you can file, you know, into extended season like a business owner. Am I just... <sighs> I'll be honest, I think the pressure of this competition might be getting to me a little bit. Either that or I'm just much more critical of myself right now than I than I usually am. All right, let's hear what old Jason Bot's got to say here. Absolutely. Tackling the tax season overload is crucial. First up, consider implementing a strict scheduling system. This means setting specific weeks or even days when clients can submit their documents Dang and it. when they can expect their returns. It's about taking control of your workflow to prevent all work from piling up at once. Second, empower your team to handle routine client communications. Assign specific team members to manage status updates and inquiries. This not only reduces interruptions for you, but also ensures clients feel attended to without needing your direct involvement every time. That was just a better answer. I don't even care what the AI judge says. That was a better answer than I gave. Uh, but let's see what the judge has to say. I'm going to lose this, aren't I? I was so confident 
You know what they say? All AI does is parrot humans that can't have original thoughts. All this thing's doing is parroting all the things that I've said, but what I'm realizing as I'm hearing this back is it's pulling these different concepts from different episodes. We spent a whole freaking week on work scheduling to manage tax season. Why didn't I bring that up? Like it wasn't top of mind at the time. The notion of pulling in other people to help with communication and status updates. Status updates are such a huge problem in taxis, and I didn't bring it up. Ugh. I got a one-point lead. Uh, it's not looking good. I'll evaluate both responses based on completeness, accuracy, and clarity, with a focus on relevance to a small accounting firm audience. Each category will be rated from 1 to 10, and I'll provide a combined score for each response. JB's response, completeness, 8, 10. JB provides two distinct ideas as requested. I would give it the issue of overwork eight. during tax season. Accuracy, seven ten. The suggestions are relevant and could potentially help, but they don't directly address reducing work hours. They focus more on workflow management. Clarity nine ten. The ideas are presented clearly and are easy to understand for a small accounting firm owner. Combined score for JB twenty four thirty. Jason's response: completeness eight ten. Jason also provides two distinct ideas as requested, directly addressing the issue of overwork during tax season. Accuracy, 9-10. The suggestions are highly relevant and directly target reducing workload during the busy season by shifting work to earlier periods and optimizing the client base. Clarity, 8-10. The ideas are generally clear, but some terms, like extension season, might need clarification for some small firm owners. Combined score for Jason, 25 to 30. Winner for question three, on three, Gertie, Sakwa, Salai. Are you okay? Chi San three year, on three, Kaka, Sai, Kori, Sai, Kori. On the air, three years and explanation. While both responses offer valuable insights, Jason's answer edges out JB's by focusing more directly on reducing workload during tax season. Jason's suggestions of tax planning and client base optimization are more strategic and have the potential for a greater long term impact on reducing work hours. JB's ideas, while helpful for workflow management, don't address the root cause of overwork as directly. Both responses are clear and complete, but Jason's slightly higher accuracy score gives him the win for this question. Okay, I'm going to lead by two. I am two points ahead, two questions to go. Question number four, the music please. My bookkeeping firm is bottlenecked at month and close delivery. Many of our deliveries are slipping until after the 20th of the month. Give me your best two tips to manage this bottleneck. So kind of like the tax season question, but the equivalent for bookkeepers. Uh, okay, um, my answer. First, see if there's a way to depressurize that month end close delivery by just giving the client the info they actually need on a real or near real time basis. For example, they usually don't understand the full financials. They may just want to be looking for a few numbers, ARAP, something specific. If so, give them those numbers right away so the full financials then aren't as urgent. Second, move forward any task you can get done in, at the end of the previous month, like fetching credit card statements that come out on the 25th. Then automate requests to go out to the client on the first of the month. Oftentimes we don't start gathering that information until the 15th and we have to ask follow-up questions and it pushes that whole timetable back. Ooh, that was kind of three things. I feel like I may have broke the rules a little bit. Let's see what the AI's got for bookkeeping firms. All right, tackling that month end close bottleneck can definitely be a game changer for your firm. First up, consider staggering your delivery dates. Not every client needs their reports at the same time. By scheduling different groups of clients to receive their reports at different times throughout the month, you can spread out your team's workload and avoid that end-of-month crunch. Second, think about leveraging technology to automate as much of the process as possible. Tools like Jotform, Airtable, or even simple solutions like Google Sheets can help streamline data collection and report generation. This reduces manual entry and helps your team focus on analysis rather than data wrangling. I guess that's true, but did that feel a little, little bit generic? Oh, <laughs> you know what I think might have happened there? Uh, so one of the hard things about training all the podcasts into uh, an AI assistant is I don't have a way to pull the ads out of the podcast. Who has probably been the most frequent advertiser on this podcast? Probably Liveflow and me talking about Google Sheets back before they had the Excel stuff. Jason Bot just said, 
um, use spreadsheets to like automate report generation. That answer may have actually come from an ad read. But you know what? I'm going to take wins any way that I can get them. Uh, but it's not my opinion that matters. Let's let's see what our uh, what our judge says here. Oh, Buzz response. Completeness 810. Jay Ball provides two distinct and well-explained tips as requested, covering both process management this is Jason and technology Bob's score? utilization. Accuracy 910. The suggestions are accurate and relevant to bookkeeping firms. Staggering delivery dates and leveraging automation are indeed effective strategies for managing month-end bottlenecks. Mm. Clarity 810. The response is clear and easy to understand for someone running a small accounting firm. The language is straightforward, and specific examples of tools are provided. Combined score for JB 2530. Jason's response. Completeness 810. Jason also provides two distinct tips as requested, focusing on client needs and task management. Accuracy 910. The suggestions are accurate and show a deep understanding of bookkeeping processes and client relationships. The idea of providing key information in real time and moving tasks forward are both effective strategies. Clarity 910. Ooh. The response is very clear and relatable for someone running very. a small accounting firm. It uses practical examples and addresses common scenarios in the industry. Combined score for Jason, 2630, winner for question four. Jason, while both responses are strong, Jason's answer edges out slightly due to its higher clarity score. Jason's response is more tailored to the specific challenges of a small accounting firm, using language and examples that would resonate strongly with the target audience. Yeah. The suggestions are also more focused on the root causes of the bottleneck, addressing both client expectations and internal processes in a way that's immediately applicable to a small firm's operations. Okay, we won that one by one point, updating the scoreboard. This episode is sponsored in part by the fine folks at GenWise. Have you ever wanted to hire like a CTO or a COO, but that's a thing you can't do because you run a firm, a small firm? You don't hire chief executive anything. GenWise, gang, they're gonna come in. They're gonna, they're gonna fill that role for you. Be that CTO, be that COO partner. All that stuff you dream of doing where you're like, that's a good idea, Jason, let's go and implement that. Or I wanna explore that tech further, that could help us. And then you never ever do? Imagine having a little buddy, little buddy alongside you where you could be like, hey, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Wise, could you come on in? Can you do this thing that we're thinking about doing for us? I do it myself, but uh, but I but whenever I say I will, I don't. Genwise are not just consultants, that arm's length agency. They're gonna work in the trenches with you through the through the good stuff and the bad stuff to actually make those changes happen. The system stuff, the hard people stuff, they're gonna be with you through all that. They get their hands dirty to ensure that change is managed effectively. They do this via weekly work sessions and asynchronous improvements. They've got, they got backdoor relationships with most of the powerhouse tech in the accounting space, so they can usually move the needle faster than a firm could on their own. Okay, dirty hands and needle movers. And the result is all those things that you always wanna do that you never get to, they happen, finally. Wow, okay, where to start? You start with GenWise's efficiency assessment, which is designed to help everybody understand exactly what needs to be improved inside your firm. Every assessment culminates in a firm roadmap that outlines all the efficiency improvements they'd recommend, along with an implementation timeline and estimated costs, just like that. But wait, there's more. Sign up now to get 25% off your efficiency assessment. Normally three and a half K discounted down to 2625. And then this entire value gets discounted from an annual engagement if your firm decides to engage them in a larger capacity. Like an onboarding project, it's a paid onboarding project, but it gets discounted against the ongoing if you become a full-blown client kind of thing. Pretty cool. If that's been a blocker for you, check out the link in the show notes to GenWise. Uh, if this hasn't been a blocker for you and you do all the things that you always say that you're gonna do, uh, then you are lying. This episode is sponsored in part by Cloud Accountant Staffing. Man, people have strong opinions on offshoring. How dare you send accounting work? Accounting work overseas. I've shared before, um, starting to hire people offshore was w probably top three, top five biggest unlocks I had in my firm running days because we're perpetually people constrained. And when we started hiring folks in the Philippines and they just became an, a part of our distributed team, I ran a distributed team and there was just one more team member. We went four for four. Every single one of them were awesome. I had never hired four people in a row onshore and all of them worked out. 
They were going through trainings alongside my onshore team. So stinking good. And the amazing thing was just the supply of accountants in the Philippines was completely different than it was here in the States. So we could actually plan and know, okay, we will be able to go out and find this type of person and that type of person before we get there. Like, here's what we want things to look like in nine months. Here's where, where we might make a hire. There's where we make a hire. I had been blocked for for years on any sort of planning like this, just because we had such a hard time finding the right people onshore. This completely changed how we ran our firm. It did change the makeup of what roles were client facing and what roles weren't client facing. It shuffled that up a bit. But there is a certain um, inevitability to the globalization of work. I'd encourage you to um, to learn more about it. I'll put a link to Cloud Account and Staffing in the show notes. You can hop on a call with them, ask all the embarrassing, the ignorant questions. It's just one of those things where a, a lot of people have strong opinions on it, but most people still just haven't done it, haven't even touched it. And I think until you work with offshore people, until you have integrated them into your business and seen the pros and the cons of it, I think it's a big blind spot, big old blind spot, particularly in the context where we are usually gonna be staffing constrained, people blocked. Right? Want to learn more about that one? Check out the link in the show notes. I'm only ahead, I'm ahead three points through four questions. We got one question left, question five, and it is, uh, it is an absolute classic. The equivalent of the meaning of life for accounting firms. What should the ultimate goal of a firm runner be? My answer. Start recording here. Uh, Oof, ultimate okay finding a sustainable enjoyable journey you got to put your own mask on first running a business is a great way to create amazing employment opportunities for other people and enable entrepreneurs in a really powerful way but it still all starts with you don't um don't over fixate on goals don't be the superhero for everyone but yourself Give yourself the space to be curious and find the version of firm running that doesn't feel like work every day. Your interests and what keeps you going is what makes you unique. Lean into that for the advantage that it is. I feel better about that one than I did the other ones. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it was too theoretical, but it's also a pretty theoretical question, right? Okay, what's the AI got? I feel like this is kind of a kind of a a bit of a woo-woo question. I don't know how well AI does with woo-woo stuff. The ultimate goal of a firm runner should really focus on creating a thriving environment where both the team and clients can succeed. For me, the most fulfilling part was building a team of incredibly talented individuals and fostering an environment that allowed them to grow and innovate one. This not only enhances the service quality for clients, but also ensures the firm is a great place to work which can significantly impact the overall success and sustainability of the business. That's pretty much what I said for myself verbatim. I said the most rewarding part was creating a cool place to work. That is what I said. Is that the ultimate goal of a firm runner though, to create a cool place to work? Or should it be, uh, should it be more centric on you? I don't know. All right, I got a three question lead. Let's see what the judge has to say. I'm, I don't know, we'll see. Oh, let's evaluate both responses based on the given criteria. JB's response, completeness, 810. Uh, JB provides a comprehensive answer, focusing on creating a thriving environment for both team and clients. The response covers important aspects like team building, fostering innovation, and ensuring quality service. Accuracy, 910. The answer aligns well with generally accepted business principles. It emphasizes the importance of team development and client satisfaction, which are crucial for a successful accounting firm. Clarity 810, the response is clear and easily understandable for someone running a small accounting firm. The language is straightforward and relatable to the target audience. Combined score for JB, 25 to 30. 25, that's... Jason's response, uh. completeness, 710. Jason covers several important points, including personal sustainability, creating employment opportunities, and maintaining curiosity. However, the response is less structured and might miss some key business objectives. Accuracy, 810. The answer provides valuable insights, especially regarding personal well-being and sustainability. However, it may not fully address all aspects of running an accounting it firm. It all comes down to this. 3, 7, 10. While the response uses seven relatable ten, language, no. it might be somewhat abstract for someone running a small accounting firm. The metaphorical language, e.g., put your own mask on first, 
may require additional interpretation. Combined score for Jason, 20 to 30, winner for question five. JB, JB's response is the winner. I don't care about your... Okay, I got a 22 and they got a 25. We tied. Are you kidding me? Yep, I got a 22, they got a 25. It came down to a literal tie. Well, what have we learned here today? Um, I have a couple notes. Uh, The things I was going to talk about after going through all the questions... And I'll be honest, I don't want to now because I didn't think I would lose. And to me, a tie with an AI is a loss. That's how I'm feeling right now. Uh, What I don't know, (laughs) I can't believe we're dead. What I don't know is, will it matter if AI is better someday? So computers have been better at, at playing chess than humans for a long time. But people don't sit around and watch computers play chess. Arguably, most people don't sit around and watch humans play chess, but that's still like a sport. That's still a thing. We're fascinated by it. We see kind of the beauty in it when uh, humans do cool things. We don't just sit around and watch a bunch of computers playing chess. But chess is a game. It's not grounded in uh, business, in money, in um, life or art. So while people often use this chess analogy to say, even if AI gets better, will humans even care? Man. I, I think when it comes to business and decision-making, people are going to want the best information possible. And whether that comes from an AI or a human, I don't know. I don't know what the answer to that is. If I were judging that, um, I think there were two answers there that without a doubt the AI did better. The other ones were a little fuzzy. There's one that I for sure know I did better. I would Honestly, for me, it would probably be a wash too if I were the judge of that. Uh, I'll have to figure out a way to pull human judges into this. And not even human judges will will judge it the same way. But that would be a really interesting second exercise to do, see where that comes in. And the bigger question, honestly, might be, what does it mean? I've built this for myself. You could also build it for yourself. And if it is as good for most people, what does that mean? Now, it doesn't, it doesn't even have to be as good to have value, as we've discussed in some past episodes. But what does that mean? I don't know, man. Drop a drop a comment below if you have thoughts. Is that interesting? Is that exciting? Or is it meaningless? Will we not take advice from AI? I honestly don't know if we will or not. Although I will say this isn't pure AI. This is AI on top of my content, on top of all the things that I said. So it's regurgitating the things I've said. It's kind of between a human and, and an AI. It's not just ChatGPT telling you something. It is the language model on top of everything that I've said. This was a super interesting exercise. It's gonna take me some time to process that. Uh, Like I said, you got any thoughts, drop them in the comments. Thanks for coming and hanging, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow.